Hello and welcome to Magic Bricks Now, India's first property channel. You're watching Property Hotline with me, Kavita Krishnan. Today we are answering all your home finance questions with Karthik Javeri. Karthik is the founder and director of Transit Consulting India Private Limited. Karthik, welcome to the show. Thank you. Let's start with an email query. Sean Dizos has written in. He says he took a home loan of 35 lakh rupees in February 2013. Now he pays an EMI of 35,000 rupees. His outstanding till date is 25 lakh rupees. Loan tenure will end in 2024. He has four SIPs of rupees 1,000 each and the accumulated fund as of today in the SIP is 4 lakh rupees. Now he earns 1.5 lakh per month. He works only seven months in a year. Should he break his SIP now, make a part payment of the loan or should he continue paying these SIPs? What should he do? It's a classic uh, personal finance question over there. Yes, the I know, loan, and uh, I'm also very curious, and you know, very, you know, um, too much on making a very, very classic sort of a statement. You see, SIPs, systematic investment plans that he's doing, is not a stopgap arrangement. Because he wants to buy a real estate and therefore in the interim he's doing SIPs and you know when there is a substantial accumulation in SIPs, he takes that money off and pays the real estate. Not such a good strategy. You see, SIPs and for that matter equity mutual fund investments and historically this has been proved is a far better investment than real estate. If you look at a 20, 30, 40 year sort of a long term average in terms of the returns that it has created. So therefore this would obviously be unwise. The second thing is you know, you can use a part of the profit if you like, but you don't use the accumulation and go back. You need to have liquidity at some point of time. And a home loan is a great loan to have because A, you're going to get tax benefits on paying of those EMIs. Secondly, the rate of interest is much lower vis-a-vis -vis the growth of your real estate, per, you know, on its own. So if you're going to pay about 9, 9.5% 9 on a home loan, you're actually earning in the range of about uh, 12 to 15% or more in terms of property appreciation. And we're not even considering C, we're not even considering the rent at the moment that you might, you know, for the other viewers as well. So in my opinion, let this loan go on, pay the EMIs, you're getting the benefits of paying the EMI, don't be in too much of a rush to pay off. And SIP is being broken and then doing this is a really bad idea. Continue it and let it, you know, let it grow simultaneously so you have assets for some other financial needs of yours which will definitely accrue over time. You know, Karthik, I think, uh, now he makes a, a point in his question. He very clearly says he works only seven months in a year. And uh, I, I don't know whether he's being paid for the rest of the five months, the balance five months in a year. Uh, right. But my understanding is this is what is worrying him and this is probably why he wants to, you know, break the SIPs and pay off the home loan so that he does, has lesser EMIs to pay. He finishes off the loan uh, much faster. But uh, to my mind, this is the very reason why he should probably continue with those SIPs and continue with the home loan. What I do you think? I absolutely agree with you. And seven months, you know, it gives me the feeling that this person probably is working on a ship where very often they have a certain months of duty on the ship and certain time, you know, which is off on the shore and which is to say that they are not sailing. Now, in that situation, you're absolutely right. I agree. You need more liquidity because it is in times like this. What if today you're not working for five months? But by the way, you can do some other business and, you know, some other employment if your company permits you and if your contract allows you to do so. So while that is one side, suppose you don't get paid, you know, there are, I mean, we are not living in the best of times as far as, you know, the Baltic index is concerned or the shipping industry per se is concerned. Uh, so, you know, you might not even get paid. So you need to have reserves, you need to have liquidity. And we always insist on having liquidity and not putting everything into real estate, which is an immovable asset. So you can't really sell 20 square feet out of your property to get some liquidity. You know, so to say, so which is why it's extremely important to make sure that you follow. And I've always been a proponent of this ratio of two is to one. For every one rupee that you have in real estate, you need to have two rupees outside real estate. It could be in fixed deposits, could be in mutual funds, could be in recurring deposits, could be in anything that you like, gold, equities, stocks. But it has to be outside. You cannot sort of overexpose yourself just to real just estate to because it's, it's immovable and it's also illiquid to a certain extent. And let's also face it, Sean, what you are essentially doing or what you're essentially planning, proposing to do here is break one asset to build another asset, which really doesn't make sense when you can have both of them together. Essentially, two very good habits, a home loan and an SIP. You should not break either of them. We have a caller on the line. Gagan has dialed in from Hyderabad. Gagan, how can we help you? Yep. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. Regarding the property loan, so mm -hmm. I have actually booked a property for which I have paid the down payment of 20%. Now, the builder is trying to get me into the bank to which he has tied up the approval. 
uh, and he's denying me to go forward with any other bank. So is there a way wherein I can, uh, you know, go for the bank of my interest? Well, I don't want to lose on the property. He's ready to refund the money in case I back out from the property. But that, again, leads me to uh, research the property again. Right. Gagan, has the developer told you explicitly that you have to take the loan only from this particular bank or is it or is he just telling you that this is this is a project that is approved by xyz bank what is the developer actually uh, telling you yeah so he's saying that i have to, i need to take the loan from this xyz bank because the payment terms of the dispersion uh, to the builders are pretty fast as compared to the bank that i'm planning for i'm planning for an sbi bank loan uh, unfortunately the property is not approved by SBI yet, it's under process, uh, whereas the uh, builder is asking me to go for LGFC bank. So essentially the builder is trying to ensure that the money comes in faster, but he cannot force Gagan to go to a particular bank, right? Well, absolutely, Gagan, you cannot be forced. But I also have a very quick uh, sort of a question to ask you. How much time has elapsed between you having given the down payment and now? I mean, has it been a long time or is it like pretty recent? No, it has been like, uh, I would say, three to four months. Okay, so three to four months, which means that your property has not appreciated. You know, a lot of times projects are stuck. So you've paid a down payment and then for three years, nothing's really happening. But in the interim, the area and the locality price has gone up so much that you don't want to exit from this deal. Okay, so here's my view uh, for you, Gagan. A, you know, you cannot be forced to take a loan from a certain uh, institution. Now, the reason they are saying take it from that institution is because I'm guessing that they have themselves been funded by them. So therefore, they have an escrow arrangement with them, you know. So the institution has funded the developer and therefore has approved the project project also or you know maybe and then for the developer to sort of repay back you know you are getting a loan funding from the same institution so effectively his liability of that loan to your extent of to the extent of your purchase is being transferred to you so to say and therefore it, it's all a lovely arrangement you know now there are two ways to look at it one hdfc bank uh, hdfc limited can't be hdfc bank by the way because they don't disburse home loans so HDFC Limited, is, as such, is a fantastic company to take a loan from. Processes are fabulous and, you know, they, they know this business inside out. They are the best in, the, uh, in this business. So therefore, go ahead and take it. In any case, we are not married with any loan anyways, right? So you have a clause where most institutions say that for six months you can't move out. Right. So you get your loan, do your property purchase. It's not such a bad deal. It's not like they will give you 2% higher than the rest of the market. So they're not going to be uncompetitive uh, from that standpoint. So you can take your loan if you want to proceed with this deal. And then in six months time, you know, you can do a refinance from SBI. And in that case, there's not going to be any charge on you as well. In fact, why SBI? If you find somebody in the market and if the interest rates have also gone down and if you're getting a benefit of maybe half percent or even a 1%, you can very happily move to them. So that's one. But the other thing is the fact remains that they cannot force you. So now it's really your call if they are absolutely adamant about this whole thing and they don't want to budge or they don't want to give an NOC or any of those kind of uh, details to you for getting a funding from another institution, maybe you can consider looking at another developer and another project. So that's probably your last resort. But otherwise, in, if an interim basis, if, they ha if they're happy with SBI, great. But uh, otherwise, if you go with HDFC, it's not such a bad idea. Right. HDFC is not a bad option, but Gagan, Nobody can force you to take a home loan from a particular bank or a particular institution. You are right in uh, pointing out that you know it is unfair. You do not need to take that home loan. However, if you can sit down and talk to the developer and uh, work things out, great. If not, if you want to, if you really, really want to buy that property, then go ahead. Like Karthik said, take it from HDFC and then probably refinance it again from SBI or any other bank. Uh, moving on, Facebook query next. Aniket Tripathi. Writes in, says he works as a sales manager with an MNC. Now, Aniket's monthly take home is approximately 30,000 rupees, which comes to around 6 lakh rupees per annum, including all benefits. He wants to buy a property in Indirapuram, which costs 32 lakh rupees. He wants to know how much should he borrow from the bank. I think uh, it's more a function of how much the bank is willing to lend to him, right? Absolutely. And, you know, for his benefit and for the benefit of other viewers also, we'll give them the mathematics. So if it's a 32 lakh property, the maximum funding that you will get to the maximum loan to value ratio that is generally followed by most institutions today is about 80%, right? So which means you'll get 80% of this money, roughly approximately 25 lakhs, so to say. Now, 24, 25 lakhs is what you can get on the upper limit. To get a 24, 25 lakh loan, you need to have an income of at least about 50,000 rupees a month. Now, what we have here is only his monthly salary, but his take-home salary. 
So I'm assuming that the difference between the take-home salary and the gross salary is not too much, considering that he said his monthly take-home salary is 30,000 rupees. So now with 30,000, my uh, assumption is that I think you will get a loan of somewhere in the range of 12 to 15 lakhs, which means, uh, you know, there's almost two-thirds of the loan that, or uh, two-thirds of the value of your property, which you will need to uh, organize yourself through your own internal resources or savings or you know borrowings from parents, friends, uh, family, whatever the case might be. But mathematically speaking, you can get up to 24, 25. But in your case with 30,000, I think 12 to 15 should be like your range. Right. And there's a question I never tire of asking uh, on the show, uh, Karthik. Uh, what is the thumb rule? How many times your salary is your home loan eligibility? So most people, most institutions would work uh, on a very, like a 30% ratio is very, very comfortable, which is to say that the installment to income ratio, installment divided by the income, 30% is very, very healthy. Uh, but there are institutions who go all the way up to about 50, 55%, 60% also. For example, if somebody's income is 3 lakh rupees a month instead of 30,000, and then if he wants to have an EMI of even uh, as much as maybe 2 lakh rupees a month, it's okay because they can assume that the, from the remaining 100,000 rupees from the remaining 1 lakh, they can pretty much live their lifestyle. But from my standpoint, my personal financial planning standpoint, I would suggest do not in under any circumstances let your home EMI go beyond 25 or 30 percent because we want to invest another 25 or 30 percent for some other liquid savings as well. And therefore, 50 percent should be your expenditure, 50 percent EMIs, uh, home loan EMIs, and uh, you know another 25 percent to manage your expenditure. And this so, 25 to 30 percent is 25 to 30 percent of your take home salary. Yeah, yeah. What you get in Absolutely. hand after you know your PA. If you tax, if etc, etc, yes. all of that has been cut off. So your EMI should be 25 to 30 percent of your take home salary. If it is any more than that, then you probably uh, are uh, setting yourself up, uh, you know, uh, for uh, problems uh, going forward, unless Absolutely. like uh, Karthik pointed out, you earn something like 3 lakh rupees uh, per month. We have another caller on the line. BM Rao has dialed in from Mumbai. Uh, Mr. Rao, how can we help you? I already sent the email. Yes, Mr. Rao, uh, but tell us what's your question. Uh, send me an email, madam. Okay. okay. I understand that, but could you uh, uh, re repeat your question again? You see, okay, I think there's a problem with the caller. Let's move on. We have a question that's coming on our website now. Uh, www.mbnow.in Mohsin says he purchased property worth 32 lakh rupees in his name. He's taken a loan of 85% for it. His father has a flat worth 1 crore rupees and plans to sell it. Now the money will be distributed equally in three parts. Can he repay the loan with the amount that he will receive from his father? I don't think there should be a problem with that. Oh yes, I mean absolutely. So just for the sake of brevity and completeness, Yes, the money that your father gives you is a gift in your hands. You will therefore not have to pay any income tax on that receipt of funds because it's coming, you know, as per the definition of relative of the Income Tax Act. So therefore, father giving money to son is completely out of the ambit of any taxation. You get the money and from that money, you can choose to do what you like. So you can e either invest it or you could, uh, you know, repay your loan or you could buy another property. I mean, the choice is completely open and all options are open before you. However, your father understand one thing that when you are making your calculation if your father is going to get one crore and if he intends to distribute it which means he's not going to buy another property and therefore he's not going to take uh, advantage of the capital gain exemptions that means he will have to pay capital gain tax so if you're thinking that one third of one crore which is about 33 lakhs is coming your way you need to just redo your calculation it will be 33 lakhs yes but minus about um, you know say ballpark 20 percent taxation out of it i mean we don't really know the indexation exact indexation values and you know what was your purchase value and all of that but broadly speaking you will not get exactly 33 you will get 33 minus the tax that you have to pay right so you need to rework your calculations a little bit over there mohsin but yes the money is yours you uh, to do whatever you please with you know you can invest like uh, Karthik said pay off your home loan invest that money or buy another property you can do whatever you please uh, Facebook query next God of Day writes and says his father owns a plot of land on which he plans to construct a house now he is planning to buy the land from his father can he avail a bank loan to purchase land do banks lend to for against land uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, companies that give you loans for purchasing a residential land. 
remember that there will be certain restrictions such as that this land has to be within the you know municipal limits of the city and municipal limits the reason they say that is because if the land is too far out then there is danger of encroachment and then there are all, all sorts of other things plus this land has to be non agricultural which means you know you should be in a situation where you can you are allowed to construct uh, some sort of a tenement and you have adequate fsi and all of that so yes i mean you know you can get a loan to build your to buy the plot in the first place and then if you want to build a house on that of course there's loan for that as well all of that is subject to the availability that uh, you know you will get in terms of the income that you are going to show and the income analysis that the institution will do for you right uh, now karthik we don't really get too many questions from people who want to take bank loans to purchase land yes. uh, now tell me this uh, what are the do- what is the documentation that you essentially need now if you're buying a flat you go ahead and show them the agreement that you are signing with the developer uh, which all, which is you know proof of the amount the price that you are actually paying for the flat and of course your other identity proof and all the other proof that the bank asks for but in case of land what are what is the documentation that you need to show you know it's uh, it's interesting but it is quite similar so very often people when they are purchasing uh, plots of land to construct a residential property they don't want to deal directly with the uh, you know with the let's say the original seller or uh, i'm the, i'm saying original seller just for the sake of convenience so what i'm trying to say is there will be some developer in the way who would have purchased the big tract of yeah, land okay plotted development plotted so developments yeah and then they would do some amount of development they will bring water lines to it electricity lines to it and then that plot is actually sellable because if you actually go out in the open land and try and buy it you don't even know who the owner is and then the complexity is so much more but if it's already a plotted development from a developer then the documents are pretty much the same except that there is no building on it but in terms of uh, things like the sat bara or things like uh, you know the the katha if you have for example in karnataka and things like all the all of that will still contain your credentials and you can actually go ahead and purchase it so pretty much the documents will be the same except that there is no building sometimes you might even have a society within what, which what, the line what if it is not a plotted development what if i want to go out buy land and uh, you know build my own house from from a private purchaser yes so i mean even that is there but then the documentation would sort of go many fold up because then the history of that land will have to be shown then you you will have to do a lot more legal paperwork to my mind if you are going to do this kind of a purchase because you know very often there may be some documents there might be some chain of documents that might be broken and you need to have a lot of permissions for that land you need to have uh, even before you start building you will need to have clearances from a variety of departments mm. and so on and so forth so you know your due diligence procedure will be so much longer and much wider in terms of the paperwork that you might have to do but you this is all an assumption you might have to do all of this it might even be very simple so a lot of legal uh, paperwork that you will need to do if you are going out to buy land directly in the market uh, however if you are going for a plotted development most of your paperwork is taken care of by the developer concerned and uh, banks are more willing to lend against that uh, would that be right yes they would also have a higher level of comfort feel because they will know that all this is already clear the title is marketable the due diligence has been done the 30 year or 50 year search reports have been brought in so that way to that extent even a, for a financier the comfort level is so much more higher if you are buying in a plotted development because right, then so all you, you have to do is just spend to construct your house right so if you're buying if you're uh, planning to buy land on a bank loan remember it's best to go for a plotted development makes your life easy makes a bank's life very very easy and that's why the bank likes to lend for plotted development projects we have a website query that's come in bharti verma says that he and his brother took a joint loan for a flat registered jointly in their names now they plan to transfer the loan to one applicant so that they can purchase another property on either of their names uh so bharti wants to know what is the process to remove the name of the co applicant he also asks what paperwork needs to be done for this right see this is a very interesting situation because very uh, very many times we've said this thing that you know two sisters or brother and sister are generally not financed uh, together because of obvious reasons that they will have their separate families and things like that very often two brothers are probably living in the same house and therefore that is okay and you know at least that's how the institutions think so now If that's all institution of, things, but we don't agree <laughs> with it. Yes, I mean I don't see any reason why two sisters can't borrow together, or for that matter, even two unknown parties, two friends, why can't they borrow it together? I mean they can pretty much do it if they wanted to. Uh, so, so here in this situation, so for every loan agreement, there are uh, there are two parts to this whole thing. If you are co-owners of the property, then the funding institution will always insist that you become co-applicants also. 
but the reverse is not necessarily true meaning you could be not the owner of a property but you could still be a co-applicant on the whole uh, you know, on this particular loan so now we have to go under that assumption that between the two of you one of you should not be the owner of the property because then that's the only logical way by which you can get out now when you get out of this how will you really get out so there is a loan agreement that the financial company has done with yourselves now in that loan agreement what they are basically saying is that the loan is be given to both of you together based on the income credentials of both of you together so technically speaking if one of you can now afford to handle the entire emi of the loan by yourself then the other person can be retired out of this loan arrangement and which means they will have to do another loan agreement again to cancel the previous one and to make the new agreement in force and when they do that new agreement in force obviously one person whoever wants to get out or exit this particular loan arrangement would have exited and the other person would that have uh, the total liability so the one who is going out will be discharged of his liabilities and the one who is staying in will have additional liability but that is again provided your income criteria suffices the banking institution or the nbfc who's lended the money so that is one thing that you need to understand now if both of you are co-owners then you know it might be difficult for you to get out of this kind of a loan arrangement however for clarification purpose let me also say that if you went ahead and applied for another loan elsewhere uh, your eligibility would be affected to the extent of the emi payable but there is nothing that stops you from actually going and applying for a new loan so by all means go ahead and try it and uh, you know see if the another institution for another property purchase that you want to do is happy and willing to lend you that money and till the time uh, you know they don't sort of disburse the loan to you you have all the decisions in your hand even if you get a sanction letter you still have the decisions in your hand whether to take the disbursement or not right so therefore that control you so have so essentially what you're saying is that they go out and take another loan again as co applicants no if they wanted to hmm. your, their, their fundamental question is can i get out of this so the answer is if you are co owners then it may be difficult for you to get out assuming okay. that one of you is not a co owner and is just a co applicant on the loan then that person may be allowed to go away provided the other person can take the entire emi based on his or her credentials you know kartik what is saying is very interesting from another point of view i'll tell you this we've also been of late getting a lot of questions from couples Yes. Uh you know who've taken uh, a home loan as co-applicants they're co-owners in a property and for whatever reason they have de decided to part ways. Right. Now that's where the problem comes because they've probably been paying their EMI for a for a couple of years or for five or six years and now they want to uh, you know one person wants to get out of that property and the other person is willing to willing and able in that sense to carry on paying that EMI. So what you are essentially saying is if you are co-owners in a property it may not be possible to do that yes now but in a situation that you suggested here where there is a couple and they are parting ways hmm. then there is a different arrangement possible even in their case they could actually have it now what you can do is you can first do a transfer of ownership which means you can relinquish your right in the property how do you do it you gift the portion of your property to the other person so in hmm. case of spouses one spouse can give his or her 50% to the other spouse how do you do it you do it by a gift deed and there has been a recent ruling as a result of recent means last couple of years by which you can only by merely writing this thing on a 500 rupee stamp you don't have to pay the entire stamp duty of even that 2% uh, which used to be the case earlier hmm. so with a 500 rupee stamping you can actually gift your share of the property to the other person you know i mean of course before you get divorced <laughs> so and it, the same applies for a brother no, but and sister both of them can also do this right yes so so even in our situation in bharti verma situation also this can happen so one of you give the property as a loan to the other whoever wants to go away so therefore now you are only a co applicant but not a co owner of the property because you have given your rights or your title to the other uh, sibling or spouse as the case might be then you are then, then it's up to the financial institution to draw up a new loan agreement and uh, you know cancel the previous loan agreement and go ahead you might have to pay the stamp duty on that loan agreement which is really no, quite nominal now kartik i know you're a lawyer as well as uh, being a you know a finance expert so which is easier convincing the bank or getting this uh, legal procedure done well i mean you will have to do the legal procedure first before you even talk to the bank so um, i mean you know i mean it's it's not like a chicken and egg situation really no no what i'm asking is what is easier making that gift deed in bharti verma's case i'm not talking about the divorce yes so if lawyer. both the brothers and sisters if both the siblings are owners of the property then go ahead make a gift deed first transfer the property to the other person whoever wants to get out will then opt out of the loan agreement later on so you have to do this this is the only procedure to do it
राइट द भारती देर यू हैव इट इट्स अ वेरी नॉवल आउट ऑफ द बॉक्स यू नो आंसर टू द क्वेश्चन दैट यू हैड एंड इट्स ऑल्सो द प्रॉब्ली द ईजिएस्ट वे आउट बिकॉज लाइक आई टोल्ड यू अर्लियर कार्तिक इज बोथ अ लॉयर एज वेल एज अ पर्सनल फाइनेंस एक्सपर्ट सो देर यू हैव इट एंड दैट्स ऑल द टाइम वी हैव ऑन टू डेज एपिसोड ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी हॉटलाइन कार्तिक जवेरी थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर कमिंग इन एंड आंसरिंग ऑल दोज क्वेश्चन and coming up with those out of the box solutions if you have any other questions related to real estate whether it's about buying selling investing in property legal issues taxes related to real estate or even home finance queries like the ones that we answered today you can reach us on ids that are flashing on your screens we'll get the country's top experts to answer each and every one of them that's a promise thank you very much for watching property hotline stay tuned to magic bricks now You can watch live TV on our website mbnow.in. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Magic Bricks Now, and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at Magic Bricks Now. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com forward slash Magic Bricks Now.